just to sort of change the track here, I'll be talking about management of intracranial hypertension, especially talking about the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines with respects to traumatic brain injury. So let's rapidly go through what we already know. The normal intracranial pressure is between 0 to 15. So transiently can rise because of coughing and sneezing. But if it's sustained over 20 millimeter of mercury, that's what we call as raised ICP. Uh, why does it occur? Because brain is a box, I mean the skull is a box and the brain is snugly fitted into the box as per the monroe kelly kelly hypothesis, you are aware of this. 80% of the space within the skull is occupied by the brain, 10% by the blood and the CSF. So any condition which brings about any change in any of these three dynamic parameters is going to cause some kind of pressure effect on the other two compartments. So the, here more commonly, if there is a sudden increase in the mass of the brain, because of some swelling or because of some bleed, then the blood supply will subsequently go down. And that's what this hypothesis says. And that is going to subsequently lead to an increase in intracranial pressure, which can become rapidly life-threatening. This increase will also depend on the rate at which it rises and the amount of uh, neuroplasticity, is that's a word if you can use. So certain brains we do know are more compliant, especially with age, there's a brain shrinkage. So there's a lot more space in the brain, around the brain. For, so they, the elderly people tend to tolerate sudden bleeds within the brain much better than a younger person would do. Just for the very fact that there's much more space to occupy and uh, for things to redistribute. But after a specific stage, there's going to be a sudden uh, rise with increase in volume. The compliance is going to go down and there's going to be rise subsequent rise in pressure. And what it's going to do? Decrease the cerebral perfusion cause ischemia, infarction, permanent, neuro permanent neurological dysfunction, and if it continues on unabated, herniation and death. Causes, multiple causes, right from venous obstruction, increased brain volume, increased blood volume, mass effect, cerebral edema, which could be of different types. Now we predominantly talk about cytotoxic and visogenic, but there's transependymal and osmotic also. So the causes are multiple, and this is just in a nutshell of all causes of raised ICP. We're going to talk about traumatic brain injury, but this is in a nutshell about everything. So especially talking about traumatic brain injury, how does it cause raised ICP? First of all, mass effect, obviously, increase in the volume of blood within the brain, edema of the brain tissue because of injury, vasodilatation, which may occur subsequently, OPP, impaired autoregulation, so on. And all this leads to the cascade of events, which leads to further secondary brain injuries and so on. So the primary injury will lead to structural and functional changes. Directly can lead to ischemia because of hampered blood supply, or it can lead to cerebral edema. Now cerebral edema is going to cause intracranial hypertension, and that's going to progress into what's called the cascade of secondary brain injury. The secondary brain injury cascade is what we can avoid to some extent. The primary obviously is beyond our help because it has already occurred by the time the patient has come to the ICU. But the secondary thing is what we're going to be focusing upon, and the main thing will be to control the intracranial hypertension. Symptoms, classically, anything which increases the pressure in the brain will present with headache, nausea, diplopia. The headache is usually described as bursting, throbbing, and worsened by any kind of straining or coughing. It's classical. Diplopia because of uh, sixth nerve palsy, because sixth nerve has the longest course within the brain. So that is the first thing which gets, starts getting affected. Decreased level of consciousness. Uh, it is better related to midline shift rather than just ICP elevation. So this is one point which I'd like to make. So you may have a raised ICP with relatively maintained sensorium and you may have a rapid deteriorating sensorium with a midline shift. Papilledema, pupillary dilatation because of third nerve palsy and if it comes down to the Cushing's triad, that is signs of ominous signs of brain stain herniation and we all know what the triad is. Hypertension, bradycardia, irregular respiration. So this is the triad. What are the types of herniation? There are six types of herniation. It's not just one most common which you know about is uncle transtentorial herniation where the uh, uh, the temporal lobe uncus sort of herniates in the brain stem leukoma diabetes insipidus subphalcine transcarvarier ascending transtentorial and the most deadliest of all is the tonsillar herniation in which global increase in the brain edema, downward displacement of the cerebral tonsils through the foramen magnum and that's going to subsequently compress your vital centers of the brain. 
So anytime this patient comes to the ER, there's a tire-based approach. The tire-based approach is a series of activities which are done for any patient with suspected raised ICP. These include, first of all, control of airway breathing and circulation, elevation of head end of bed, keep the neck in the midline. If you have a traumatic brain injury, fit a collar. Try to maintain normothermia because anything which increases the temperature obviously going to increase the cerebral metabolic oxygen requirement. For tumor-induced vasogenic edema or inflammatory edema, that's the only condition which steroids are indicated. Otherwise, this is the only level one recommendation in entire TBI guidelines, no steroids. That is the only level one. Everything is level two, level three. This is the only level one. Analgesia for pain, sedation, anti-seizure medications. Why? Because seizures will again increase the oxygen requirement. Avoid hyponatremia. Tire ones, once these things do not really work, then we start talking about specific therapies to reduce the brain swelling, which is hyperosmolar therapy, slight hyperventilation, 35 to 38, external ventricular drainage, decompressive craniotomy. Here it's coming earlier, but as per current guidelines, it comes towards the end. If it doesn't work, they go to tire two, where we give deep sedation, further cause further hypocapnia, neuromuscular block, and finally, barbiturate coma and moderate hypothermia. But in the context of traumatic brain injury, it sort of changes. Here, decompressive craniotomy comes much later. With, that is with respect to the current evidence which we have, the trials, the Dedekara and the rescue ICP, which says that you may save the patient, but you will end up as a vegetable. So this is not much of a point doing it very early. Probably as if the secondary measures fail, the second tier two measures fail, then only you go in for a decompressive craniotomy. So what exactly are these uh, guidelines? This is the fourth edition of the guidelines. It's considered to be a living guideline model. There won't be a fifth edition. There won't be any further editions. What it says is that it's a continuum of new evidence which is going to come, and the guidelines is going to, just the recommendations will keep changing with time. But it will continue to be the fourth guidelines as for now. So they are different uh, quality of evidences. Level one, high quality, which is highly recommended with evidence-based prospective randomized control trials. Level 2A, moderate quality, well-designed trials without randomization. Level 2B, case control or cohort studies. Level 3 is low quality or just expert opinion. So just keep in mind, most of the evidence with regards to TBI is level 2 or level 3, except for level 1, which is don't give steroids in TBI. Now, the most two important aspects which we like to control in TBI is maintain the blood pressure, reduce the ICP, right? So the blood pressure, most critical role. Blood pressure also plays a role in two different ways. If autoregulation is preserved, if the SBP is low, then there will be a vas compensatory vasodilatation in the brain. And in case the blade, uh, blood is already there, the blood is going to, volume is going to increase. So that's also bad. So fall in blood pressure with, a re with preserved autoregulation is going to cause damage in the form of vasodilatation. On the other hand, if the autoregulation is hampered or destroyed or affected because of the traumatic brain injury, then a low blood pressure will say that it the supply to the brain will totally be flow dependent. So low blood pressure means low flow, low supply to the brain, and subsequent secondary brain injury. So a systolic blood pressure becomes a very important target, and it is recommended very strongly to have an invasive monitor for systolic blood pressure measurement, for blood pressure measurement, and for an invasive ICP monitor as well, especially in severe traumatic brain injuries, to reduce the two-week mortality. The level which is universally agreed upon is more than 110. Okay, 110 now. I mean, earlier it was different in different age group, now it's 110. So SBP more than 110 is what should be targeted to maintain a good, reasonably good cerebral perfusion pressure. Second comes to intracranial pressure monitoring. Now there are different types of monitors. The intraventricular monitor is the gold standard. Otherwise we have the intraparenchymal, the, the epidural, the subarachnoid, uh, monitors and as I said uh, the guidelines say that you should at least have a significant association with improved survival in patients with severe head injury if you continue if you at least monitor the intracranial pressures in the initial period of time in severe traumatic brain injury where GCS is less than eight anything is that so the different types of monitors have different advantages as I said gold standard is ventriculostomy catheters it also permits, it's therapeutic as well, it also permits drainage of CSF and also allows administration of drugs in case the patient has some kind of meningitis. And there is in vivo calibration, but it is invasive, obviously. There's risk of infection, there's risk of hematoma, it requires a surgeon to put it in, all those things are there. We can have a micro uh, transducer sensor tip, which is allows the local brain uh, tissue oxygenation, which is there, which can be used, and these days it's used quite often. Subarachnoid catheters, epidural catheters can also be used. 
And the lumbar CSF pressure monitor doesn't actually reflect the ICP. It is just a lumbar drain to re remove the extra amount of CSF. What are the indications? Level two, all salvageable patients with severe TBI plus an abnormal CT scan. So there you're going to be doing it. And what do you mean by abnormal CT scan? He hematomas, contusion, swelling, herniation, compressed uh, brain systems. Any of these things, you will put in an intraventricular drain. Because an intraventricular uh, monitor, especially a ventriculostomy, when we put it, it is very good for reducing the C uh, ICP acutely also. So that is one reason why you do it. And a level three evidence is that if the patients have a normal CT scan, but at time of admission, one or two of two or more of this is there, which is age more than 40 years, unilateral or bilateral motor posturing, and a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. As I said, the target was more than 110. So any of two or more of this criteria are met, then you should also go in for an ICP monitor. But this is a level three recommendation. So thresholds, now the threshold is 22. Okay, uh, treat ICP about 22 because values about this have higher mortality. So this is the new target, 20 to 22. Uh, combination of ICP values and clinical brain CT findings may be more useful to make decisions. Why? Because the targets change with time. This is also one thing. So the targets will change. Now with new literature says that there will be different targets at different stages of brain injury. So uh, a 22 can be taken as a ballpark figure. Now coming to the perfusion pressures or the CPP thresholds. Now CPP is basically mean arterial pressure minus the ICP or the central venous pressure, whichever is higher. Now in traumatic brain injury, we presume that the ICP is high. We try to, the best for survival and favorable outcome is a CPP between 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Less than 50, very harmful, avoid, because the autoregulatory capacity of the brain is gone. Between 50 to 150 is autoregulatory capacity. Below 50, there is no autoregulatory capacity of the brain. That is dangerous. Extreme high CPP above 70 is also not good because you're going to be doing it by giving fluids, uh, infusing vasopressors, so secondary injury because of the, uh, because of brain injury, you may have systemic involvement also. You have high incidence of ARDs in such kind of patients, so you try to avoid in this. So between 60 and 70, it's not very clear whether 60 should be the target or towards more towards 70, but that will totally depend upon the autoregulatory capacity. As I said, if autoregulation is preserved, you can go towards the lower end. If the autoregulation is hampered, try to go for the upper end. Decompressive craniotomy, now this is the maximum amount of uh, recent trials which have been done on this. So now the level new evidence is that it should be performed for late refractory ICP elevation. When you're talking about mortality benefits, not early, but late. After the tier two measures have failed, then you come to tier three. <coughs> and uh, secondly, for early refractory ICP uh, elevation, it is not recommended anymore. It's not as if it's the first line of treatment that you go ahead and you do a decompress the credit And when we talk about whether small versus large, a large is preferred as compared to small. But when you talk about ICP control, if you want to have rapid control in the ICP, then it can be used either early or either late. Here we are not thinking about mortality, we are just trying to look for survival. It can be used at any stage, but the outcomes may not be favorable in the sense of neurological outcomes. Survival may be there, but the patient may end up as a vegetable. This is with regards to the recent rescue ICP trial, which has been which came out in 2016, actually not very recent, but that also supported what the DECRA was saying previously. Now, hyperosmolar therapy. How does it work? They work through brain dehydration. Reducing the blood viscosity leads to increased microcirculatory flow, right? And that subsequently causes constriction of the pile arterioles, causing decreased cerebral blood volume and decreased intracranial pressure. So how it is shrinking and reducing the pressures within the brain. So the levels go from one, two, and three. What it suggests that hyperosmolar therapy should be given first and foremost, okay? But you cannot recommend one over the other. So what are the two ones which you give these days? Manitol and 3% saline. So more evidence is towards 3%. In, if you talk about smaller studies and all, my evidence is that 3% is probably a better agent as compared to Manitol and should be the first line agent in case Manitol is not available. So that should be second line. But there is no recommendation currently which says very strongly that Manitol is preferred over 3%. Okay, 3% we give around 1.4 to 2.5 ml per kg. Manitol we know 0.5 to 1 gram per kg. That is the dose which you give. And you should restrict Manitol prior to ICP monitoring, especially in patients of transterritory herniation because you shrink the brain further, it's going to just herniate further. So there, without uh, monitoring in place, you should not be giving it immediately. Okay. Right. right. So CSF drainage, 
an external ventricular drain zeroed at the level of the tragus or the midbrain. That is the level at which we zero it. And uh, we can use it to lower the ICP with GCS less than six during the first 12 hours, and that can be considered. This is again a level three evidence. Anesthetic analgesic sedatives, this comes much, much later. High dose only when there's a refractory raised ICP. Hemodynamic instability should be confirmed before and after. Propofol is recommended, but long and extended large dose of propofol can lead to propofol infusion syndrome. One should watch out for that. Steroids, no, no, no. Only level one recommendation, as I said. Seizure prophylaxis. Now, seizure prophylaxis, post-traumatic seizures can be classified as early or late, within seven days, later than seven days. And post-traumatic epilepsy is recurrent seizures more than seven days following injury. The incidence is almost 12%. What it does is that there are risk factors for it, especially if there is GCS less than 10, there's immediate seizure after injury, depressed fractures, penetrating injuries, cortical contusions, age greater than equal to 65, or patient is chronically alcoholic. Now, how does seizure really affect us? There is seizure as such does not cause any mortality difference, but it can cause initial further deterioration because it increases the oxygen requirement. So patients with severe brain injury should be given seizure prophylaxis. Let me just give it as a uh, message on to you and uh, it, uh, so what this is, and there's also no much evidence based saying levetiracetamide is better than anytoin or not so each is up to you whatever you may suggest to be given some of your neurosurgeons may be very keen on phenytoin but levetiracetamide is also not a bad option otherwise ventilation therapy right hyperventilation is recommended as a temporizing measure for elevated and what do we hyperventilate up to? Somewhere between 30 to 35. There are certain um, uh, guidelines which say up to 25 also, especially when you talk about tier three, when there's refractory, super refractory, that is different. Profile, uh, prolonged prophylactic hyperventilation less than 25, not recommended. Hyperventilation should be specifically avoided in the first 24 hours. Why? Because you can cause, yes, further ischemia because the cerebral blood flow is critically reduced. So there you don't want to vasoconstrict further. It may actually be a problem. And if hyperventilation is actually being used, you should also measure the jugular venous oxygen saturation or the brain tissue partial pressure, right? So that you can understand what is the difference between the demand and the supply of the brain, okay? The same time oxygenation obviously should be maintained. This is a no-brainer. So this is the sequence of things and the amount of evidence which is regards to ICP alone. So ICP alone, resection of mass lesions, Decompressive creativity. These are probably the most effective measures. The rest of the measures are general prophylactic, hyperosmolar, hyperventilation. These call limited amounts. So this is the general measure list. If you see benefit for gen uh, with regards to uh, general prophylactic measures, BP and CPP optimization has the clear cut benefit. Temperature control has a benefit, but prophylactic hypothermia in the initial stages really has no benefit and should not rather not be given. Glycemic control also has a lot of benefit. When you talk about acute intervention, here therapeutic hypothermia over a longer period of time may have a benefit, especially the patient is refractory. But the idea is to avoid hyperthermia. Try to maintain normothermia at least. There are lots of other literature about hypothermia regarding whether only the uh, head and head should be uh, become made cold. There should be short term or long term. Short term has no much benefit. Long term up to five days may have some benefit. So there's a lot of literature that's ever evolving. So in the summary current guidelines, treat ICP greater than 22, CPP between 60 to 70. Patients less than 110 SBP should be considered hypotensive. This in contrast with previous guidelines. Prophylactic hypothermia has not been established as primary strategy as per addition and requires additional research. Insufficient evidence about clinical outcome with any specific hyperosmolar therapy, your choice. And uh, it does reduce ICP in a, in a long term, especially given prolonged and only for the head, but no major outcome dif difference with therapeutic hypothermia. So no, no prophylactic, therapeutic may be an option at that stage. So uh, except spontaneous ICH, more data is required with regards to surgery with traumatic uh, ICH. And rescue ICP also says that uh, it, conventional therapy will should not go in for early, rather go in for late, and it should be as a rescue measure rather than a primary measure because uh, the meaningful outcome becomes less as compared to this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shikant.